Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about the very recently detected FRB that was actually found in our own galaxy. And even though originally we didn't really know what caused it, now we might have found the answer. Let's talk about this and welcome to the Math. So today there are quite a lot of mysteries of the universe that we still have no idea how to even approach solving. Some of them are related to neutron stars, some of them are related to black holes, some of them are related to phenomena we don't really understand at all, like dark matter. But there is one phenomenon that we are slowly getting close to solving even though it was only originally discovered about 13 years ago in 2007. This is the phenomenon that's referred to as the FRBs, fast radio bursts. They're called fast bursts because they happen so quickly that it's almost impossible to see them without very, very specialized uh, equipment. They only last for a millisecond, but whatever creates them is extremely powerful. Something really, really massive and something very energetic. Simply because they are coming from really far away distances and produce enough energy to be detected here on Earth. We've already detected a lot of different types of FRBs, some of them repeating, some of them with very predictable patterns, and some of them only seem to happen once. But in the last few years or so, especially thanks to specialized observatories like this one right here, known as CHIME, or maybe CHIME in Canada, we've been able to find a lot more of them than we originally could with some of the initial observations. So today we know that there are a lot of these events happening pretty much every single minute. And some of them happen a lot closer to us in our own galaxy, and some of them also seem to suggest they happen around objects we've been already studying for a very long time, specifically neutron stars. But the biggest breakthrough in FRB studies came in April of 2020, when we were able to discover one coming from our own galaxy, from a region where we knew there was something known to us, a magnetar, a type of a neutron star with an extremely powerful magnetic field. This magnetar, known as SGR 1935, is essentially something we've studied previously, but we never really expected it to be the source of these FRBs. But with this new detection, we now can definitely confirm that certain FRBs come from magnetars or neutron stars for sure. We just don't really know what makes other FRBs yet. So, in the last few months, a lot of new studies started to come out about this particular event, trying to investigate what could have caused this particular FRB. In other words, what exactly caused the signal to be created in the first place? It couldn't have just formed from nothing. And thanks to all of the amazing data from CHIME CHIME Observatory, the scientists were kind of able to answer that question as well. There are actually a few answers currently, but the best one is in regards to a possible collision with an asteroid. And the paper about this you can also find in the description below. So what the scientists here suggest is that something like this happened. Now this is going to be an extremely primitive representation of this, but here is a neutron star, this is just a regular pulsar that we have in Universe Sandbox Simulation, and here is the potential asteroid that collided with it. As you can see, in terms of the actual size, it might have even been bigger. At least that's what we have in this simulation. Now even though the asteroid is bigger in size, its mass is minuscule in comparison to the neutron star. The neutron star here has a mass of at least one mass of the sun, but most likely at least uh, one and a half masses of the sun. And so it does create a lot of really, really powerful tidal effects around it. In this vicinity, nothing can possibly orbit it. It's instantly going to be shredded into a spaghetti. It's basically going to become tidally stretched into an extremely long piece of matter that will be then suddenly slammed into the neutron star that will create an excessively powerful explosion. But not knowing what's going to happen in this simulation, let's just run it and see what happens. So as soon as I unpause this, you will notice that it basically kind of just gets swallowed and um, I guess nothing really changes for the neutron star other than it having this unusual spot on the surface where the asteroid collided with it. And that's obviously because this simulation is far from perfect, even though it does produce really interesting tidal effects that you can see right here when the asteroid is orbiting the neutron star. So what exactly did the scientists do here? Well, what they were able to calculate is what would happen if a certain asteroid collided with a typical neutron star and what kind of effects would be observed from here on Earth. And while this particular asteroid is creating this beautiful accretion disk, let's go and check out the paper. 
According to them, a certain type of uh, asteroid of a certain size and a certain mass would actually be propelled toward the neutron star, spaghettified, and then stretched in such a way that it would actually fall right here onto this region along the magnetic lines of the magnetar. And because this region is somewhat close to the other region where it emits astrophysical jets, it's thus quite possible for us to see its other emissions. But what caused these emissions? So what we've observed from Earth were two types of emissions. We saw the X-rays and the radio waves. When all of this matter collided with the neutron star and it took a roughly around 10 milliseconds between the so-called leading edge and the lagging edge, this produced a tremendous amount of X-rays. And this was purely due to the collisional force between the asteroid matter and the neutron star itself. So by the time that all of this matter collided with the neutron star, it literally got entirely converted to the X-ray radiation that we observed here from Earth. This is obviously a little bit counterintuitive because when something falls on Earth, for example, it might break, it doesn't just convert into energy, but for a neutron star with extremely powerful magnetic fields and also extremely, extremely powerful gravitational fields, when something does fall onto their surface, the actual velocity at the time of the fall can be very, very close to the speed of light. At that point, matter gets destroyed completely and turns into energy. Here on Earth, we observe very similar effects in particle accelerators when we actually take two particles and slam them into one another and they produce energy as well. But on neutron stars, this just happens naturally. And this infalling column doesn't just experience X-rays, it also experiences a lot of different shock waves that produce other types of energy and also possibly even other types of matter, but only for a very, very short period of time. But interestingly, in this particular detection, there were two different peaks of X-ray radiation, and the scientists behind this paper suggest that it's very likely that this asteroid, as it was falling into the neutron star, got broken up into two pieces, with both pieces then slamming into the neutron star, but with a slight delay of about 30 milliseconds. And based on this delay, the scientists can even estimate the size of the asteroid, suggesting that the distance between these two pieces was roughly around 3.5 kilometers, or I guess the size of a typical asteroid here in the solar system. And although explaining the X-ray radiation is relatively easy with a collision from an asteroid, how do they explain the FRBs? Where did the radio bursts come from? Well, according to them, during the collision within the magnetosphere, this also created a relatively large plume of plasma matter. So kind of like this large, very powerful and very energetic plasma cloud that was created by all of the matter colliding with the neutron star, where a lot of the electrons were then stripped from the matter. This plasma cloud most likely only lasted for an extremely short time, but in some sense it's equivalent to various types of explosions that occur here on Earth that also produce plasma clouds as well. As this plasma cloud was moved around the neutron star by the extremely powerful magnetosphere, it started to emit a lot of radio waves that was then seen here on Earth. And these radio waves were essentially the radio bursts that we've observed. But because all of this happened so extremely fast on the neutron star, because things here are just way, way beyond our comprehension, the first radio burst only lasted for about 0.6 milliseconds, and the second radio burst was only about 0.34 milliseconds, with roughly around 30 milliseconds um, in between them. In other words, this was all extremely fast and the entire plasma cloud disappeared right afterwards. But interestingly, the scientists behind this paper also predicted that because of this collision, certain other follow-up events could be seen in the next few weeks or even months. And interestingly, we actually did detect additional radio pulsations coming from this region only a few weeks ago or a few months after the initial event. In other words, they did kind of have a bit of a confirmation to this idea, this theory of the collision with an asteroid. But such an event could really only occur around a magnetar and possibly not around a typical neutron star, simply because extremely, extremely powerful magnetic fields are needed to create all of these effects and a neutron star itself might not really possess the necessary conditions. So because of these observations and this idea, we now are kind of convinced that magnetars could be responsible for most of the FRBs we're seeing, at least um, in some of the galaxies. There could be other ways that are generated, but magnetars do seem to be the ones that create the most. At least that's the initial implication right now. 
At the same time, this observation and this theory also suggests that there might be additional observations coming from SRG 1935, such as for example the um, so-called glitches. These are basically kind of like earthquakes or technically starquakes on the surface of the neutron star that are caused by something that disrupts the surface initially. Scientists in this paper suggest that the crust on the surface may have become more unstable as a result of this collision, and we might see effects of this in the next few months or years. At the same time, they also suspect that the actual period of pulsations may have been also slightly changed, and this can be observed in the next few years as we measure the pulsations more accurately. Right now it's hard to tell because the actual changes would be very, very, very minuscule. And although there could be other explanations to what happened here and why we've observed these certain things, the follow-up observations are going to definitely tell us what exactly happened around this magnetar and if it's actually an asteroid collision after all. Most importantly, since we know there are certain neutron stars that do have disks of planetary material around them, and even planets orbiting around them, and you can learn more about this in one of the videos I made previously, there's no reason not to suspect an asteroid collision here. Asteroid collisions should happen pretty frequently around neutron stars. And their frequency can easily explain why we're seeing so many FRBs pretty much everywhere around us. A lot of these FRBs could easily be these collisions between neutron stars and various types of matter orbiting around them. But obviously because these objects are so much more powerful than a typical planet or even a regular star, a typical collision with a neutron star will produce very, very dramatic effects. And as you can see here, after only a few minutes, we were able to create an extremely powerful accretion disk from a simple asteroid that orbited around a typical neutron star. So anyway, we don't really exactly know for sure if this was an asteroid collision, but as of right now, this is probably the best explanation we have that seems to make a lot of sense and even has a few things we can try to observe to see if this is exactly what happened. I'm sure in the next year or so we'll be able to explain this even better, and I'm also sure we'll see a lot more unusual FRBs that will help us redefine or explain these things even better as well. But for now, the explanation to the mysterious FRBs seems to be neutron stars and collisions with these unusual objects. Actually, not just neutron stars. Extremely powerful magnetars. Neutron stars with very, very powerful magnetic fields because these magnetic fields do seem to play a very important role in forming the actual plasma cloud on the neutron star that then releases these radio bursts. But I guess only time will tell if we're right or not. For now, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Check out the paper in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else you may have not known before. Maybe support this channel Patreon, and maybe support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, Space out, and as always, bye-bye.